Ali Hadith and Exposition, Second Revised Edition. Author Sayyid Ruhla Musabi Khomeini. 36th Hadith. The Attributes of God. Arabic Text. English Translation. With my continuous chain of authorities, reaching up to the Fiqhat al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Yaqub al-Kulayni from Ali ibn Ibrahim, from Muhammad ibn Khalid al-Tayyasi, from Safwan ibn Yahya, from Ibn Muskan, from Abu Basir who said, I heard Abu Abdullah salam say, God, the Almighty and the Glorious, was our Lord even at a time when knowledge was His essence, and there was no not knowable. Hearing was His essence, and there was no audible thing. Seeing was his essence, and there was no visible thing. And power was his essence, and there was nothing subject to power. Thus when he created things and the knowable came into being, his knowledge pertained to the known thing, his hearing to that which is audible, and his sight to that which is visible, and his power to that which is subject to power. Abu Basir says, I asked him, hadn't God been ever moving? He replied, exalted is God above that. Indeed, movement is a quality that comes into existence, muhadath, by action. Abu Basir says, I asked him, hadn't God been ever speaking in pre-eternity? He replied, speech is a quality that comes into existence, sifatun mahdatha, and is not eternal, azil. God Almighty and Glorious existed, and he was not a speaker. Exposition in the statement, Lam yazallillahi azza wa jalla rabbana rabbana is apparently the predicate khabar of rizal. And the phrase wal alam dhata is the adverb of condition hal for it. However, such an assumption does not give smooth salas meaning, nor does it achieve the purpose. Because the purpose is not to affirm the eternity of God's lordship, but to affirm the pre-eternity of his knowledge and its precedence over the knowable. It may be said the phrase Rabbana is in the nominative case Murfu and is opposite to the noun Ism of Zal, with the predicate Khabar being omitted Mahduf, as indicated by the phrase Wal Alam Zata. Assuming the ellipsis, the sentence would be like this Lam Yazallillahi Azza wa Jalla Rabbana Wal Ilmu Zatuhu. And it is possible that zal is a perfect verb, tamma, sufficing with the nominative case on the basis of which it would be zal yazul, not zal yazal, for the past tense of yazal is always defective, naqis, contrary to yazul, which is always perfect. And in the phrase, wakan al ma'loom khan is here complete, meaning that when he created the things and the knowable came into existence. In the phrase mahaddatha bil fa'l it is probable that the expression bil fa'l is opposed to bil quwwah and maybe in the sense of verbal noun meaning that an attribute that is realized with creation cannot be god's attribute there are some noble topics that have been referred to in this hadith and we shall discuss some of them to an extent appropriate to this discourse the identity of god's attributes with his essence it should be known that there is a reference in this noble tradition to God's sacred essence being identical to his true attributes of perfection, like knowledge, power, hearing, and sight. This is one of the most important topics of philosophy in Kalam, whose elaborate treatment is, however, outside the scope of this treatise. Here we will refer to the true position in this regard in accordance with firm metaphysical proofs of the philosophers, Hukama, and the way of the people of Gnosis, Ahl al Ma'rifa. It should be known that it has been clearly established in its appropriate place that that which belongs to the categories of perfection and beauty derives from the mainspring of existence and the root of the reality of being, and that in the realm of existence there is no more than one noble principle which is the mainspring of all perfections and the source of all goodness, and that is the reality of being haqiqat al-wujud. And were the totality of perfections not the same as the reality of being, and were there some kind of duality in the context of concrete reality, of whatever form or separation from it, that would imply that there are two principles in the domain of being which in turn implies many inadmissible conclusions. Hence, whatever that is perfection is not such on the basis of meaning and essence, but by virtue of actualization and realization in the context of concrete reality. 
And that which is real in the context of concrete reality is one principle, which is existence. Hence, all perfection derives from one principle, which is the reality of existence. It has also been clearly established that the reality of existence is sheer simplicity in all aspects, and composition is absolutely precluded from its sacred precincts, as long as it retains its essential and original sheerness and purity of its own reality. However, when it descends from its original reality, it assumes composition in an accidental manner, at the plane of the intellect as well as eternal reality in accordance with its planes and stations, mashahid wa manazil, but in respect of its essence, that it remains single and composition is something alien to it and accidental. Two sublime principles are inferred from these explanations. First, that which is simple in all aspects is the totality of perfections in one and a single aspect. And in the same aspect that it is existent, it is also knowing, powerful, living, and willing, and all the other names and attributes of beauty and glory are true of it. He is the knower in the same aspect that he is powerful, and powerful in the same aspect that he is the knower. Without there being any difference of consideration, etabar, even on the plane of the intellect, and as to the difference of the concepts of the names and the words that are used to represent them, which are unconditioned, la bishart, intellectual concepts, it does not correspond to a difference in concrete reality, and it has been clearly established that numerous concepts of perf- perfection are abstracted from one thing. Rather, that which is implied by the foregoing explanation is that all the concepts of perfection are abstracted from a single aspect, Haythiyat al Wahida. And if the concepts of perfection were to be extracted from different aspects, as in the case of some contingents, that is accidental and that is due to the descent, the nozzle of the reality of existence and its accidental mingling with non existencies. The second principle is that that which is perfect in all aspects and as absolute perfection and goodness must be simple in all aspects. And from these two, another principle is inferred that that which is composite in whatever manner is not perfect in all aspects and is subject to deficiency and non-existence as well. And that which is deficient is not absolutely simple. Therefore, as God the exalted is completely simple in composition, which implies contingency, poverty, and dependence on another, does not affect him absolutely. He is perfect in all aspects and possesses all the names and attributes, and he is the very ground of reality and the essence of being, without his existence bearing any taint of non-existence, and without his perfections bearing any taint of imperfection. Hence he is sheer being for where non-existence to find way into him, the evil of composite things, which consists of the composition of existence and non-existence would find way into him. This he's the sheerness of knowledge, the sheerness of life, the sheerness of power, the sheerness of sight, of hearing, and all other perfections. This explains the statement of Imam Sadiq al salam that Arabic text, English translation, and knowledge is his essence, and so are power, hearing, and the sight of his essence. The statements of the philosophers on the division of divine attributes. It should be known that the divine philosophers have divided the attributes of Allah, the exalted, into three kinds. First, the true attributes, sifat al-haqiqiyah, and these have been divided into two kinds, the absolute true attributes, sifat haqiqiyah mahda, such as life, subsistence, eternity, and the like. And the relational true attribute, sifat, haqiqiyah, that, al idafa like knowledge, power, and will, which involve a relation to the objects of knowledge, power, and will, ma'loom, maqdur, and murad. These two kinds of attributes are considered by them to be the same as the essence, that. Second, the absolutely relative attributes, sifat idafiyya, mahda, such as the attributes of being the originator, provider, merciful, omniscient, omnipotent, and the like. Third, the absolutely negative attributes, sifat salbiya mahda, such as unlikeness, two creatures, uddusiya, oneness, fardiya, transcendence, subuhiya, and the like.
These two latter kinds of attributes are considered by them to be additional to the sacred essence and all the negations are considered to derive from a single negation, which is the negation of contingency, salb al-imkan. Similarly, all the relations are referred to as a single relation, which is the relation of creatorhood, muwajdiyya, and the source of relations is referred to the illuminative and emanative relation, idafa yi ishraqiyya wa idafa yi fiddiyya. This author does not consider as valid these divisions, along with the identification of the true attributes with the essence and the consideration of the relative and negative attributes as additional, as mentioned by them with their proofs, and he considers them neither in conformity with the firm metaphysical proofs nor with the correct conceptions of Gnosis. That is because none of the attributes are to be considered as being identical with the essence when dealing with the concepts of the names and the attributes from the viewpoint of conceptual multiplicity. And should we regard the essence as being identical with the relative or the negative attributes, that would imply that God the Exalted is pure relation and identical with the negative aspect. Similarly, if he is regarded as being identical with the true attributes, that implies that God the Exalted is the same as derivative conceptions, mafahim itibariya, and rational ideas, ma'ni aqliya, and he's exalted above that, and should we consider the realities of the attributes and the concrete instances of the names and the attributes, then all the names and the relative as well as the true attributes are found to be the same as the sacred essence. And the difference between knowledgeability Alamiya and nowhere alam and powerfulness, qadiriya and powerful qadir is only that of conceptual consideration. And all the relational attributes derive from his essential mercifulness, rahimiya and beneficence, rahmaniya, even the attributes of being the provider, raziqiya and creator, khaliqiya and the rest. Also with respect to their reducing all the negations to the negation of contingency and all the relations to a single relation, and their abstaining from reducing the true attributes to anything, it may be remarked that should we consider this matter from a conceptual weave point, none of them derives from another, neither in the negations nor the relations nor the true attributes, but if the realities are taken into view, all the true attributes also refer to the one necessary reality, the identity of the attributes with the sacred essence. The true position concerning the attributes in the idiom of theoretical philosophy, Hikmat al-Nazari, is that the true and relative attributes are absolutely different from a conceptual viewpoint, and none of them is the same as the sacred essence. From the viewpoint of reality, all of them are the same as the sacred essence. However, there are two planes of the attributes. One is the plane of the essence and the attributes of the essence, osaf from which we can abstract knowledge and knowledgeability, power and powerfulness. The other one is the station of the attributes of act, osaf from which too one can abstract the concepts of knowledge and knowledgeability, power and powerfulness. As to the negative attributes such as his unlikeness to creation, qudasiyah, and his transcendence, subuhiyat, and the names of tanziyah, negation of the finite characteristics of the creatures with respect to God. They are implied by the sacred essence, and the sacred essence is an accidental instance, mistaq bil'arad, in relation to them. Because God the Exalted is absolute perfection and the essential instance of absolute perfection, that is because he is the principle of reality and negation of deficiency is among its implications and perfection is the accidental instance of the negation of deficiency. The Gnostics and the people of the heart consider the station of the manifestation, maqam al-tajalli, at the plane of the most sacred emanation, fayd al-aqdas, as the source mabda of the names of essence, and the station of manifestation at the plane of the sacred emanation, fayd al-maqaddas, as the source of the attributes of act. They do not consider the manifestation at the plane of the sacred emanation as other, than the essence, in the same way that they do not consider it to be the same ayn as the essence either. 
A discussion around this topic will lead up to a discussion of the names and the attributes in accordance with their way, and that will take us beyond our present purpose. And some have referred divine attributes to privative matters, considering knowledge as a non-existence of ignorance and power as the non-existence of inability. And among the people of Madifa, someone whom I have seen insisting on this matter was the August Gnostic Marhum Qadi Sa'id Qummi, who in the course of a discourse mentioned in Sharh al-Tawheed, has apparently followed his teacher, the Marhum Mullah Rajab Ali. For a time, we had given a reply based on metaphysical reasoning to his argument, replying as well to his recourses to the literal meanings of some traditions. The Priority of Knowledge to Creation among the noble issues referred to in the sacred tradition is that knowledge with its knowables precedes creation in pre-eternity, a matter which itself as well as its character as to whether it is detailed or non-detailed are subjects of a great controversy. There is also a controversy as to whether it is additional to the essence of that or the same, whether it precedes creation or accompanies it with all the related details which are in their books. We will confine ourselves to establishing the truth of the matter and refrain from criticism or refutation of other opinions. It should be known that that which stands established with the people of metaphysical reasoning and the companions of Gnosis is that which has been indicated in this noble tradition that the knowledge of the known things precedes creation in pre-eternity azil, and that it is the same as the essence. That his knowledge is detailed is indicated by the statement that he was the seer when there was nothing visible, and hearer when there was nothing audible, because sight and hearing entails the observation of visibles and audibles, in a detailed manner, as is clear enough. Also, it refers to his detailed knowledge where it says, فَإِذَا أَحَدَّثَ الْأَشْيَاءَ وَكَانَ الْمَعْلُومُ وَقَعَ الْعَلْمُ مِنْهُ عَلَى الْمَعْلُومُ So when he brought the things into being and the known came into existence, his knowledge pertained correspond to the known. That is because his knowledge did not obtain a new subsistence after creation, but pertained to the known after its acquiring subsistence. Now we shall explain the meaning of the knowledge pertaining to the known. The explanation of this noble faith-related theme on the basis of the approach of the authorities among the philosophers is that, as known from the preceding section, God the Exalted is absolute existence and absolute perfection. Absolute existence with its complete simplicity and unity encompasses all perfections and all existence to utmost perfection. That which is outside the realm of its existence is non-being. That which is outside the realm of its existence is non-being. Deficiency and inadequacy and, in a word, nothingness, la shayya. The relation of other planes of existence to that sacred essence is that of deficiency to perfection. The knowledge of absolute perfection is the knowledge of perfection in its absoluteness without deficiency or inadequacy. And this is the very universal, simple, and detailed disclosure, as not even an iota of existence from pre-eternity to eternity is beyond the realm of his knowledge, and there can be no trace of plurality and composition in it. According to the approach of the Gnostics, God the Exalted encompasses all the names and the attributes at the plain Hadrat of Wahidiya and the station of nominal inclusiveness, Jam Asma'i. The fixed archetypes, Ayan, Thabita, of all existence are implied in the divine names at the plane of inclusiveness prior to creation in pre-eternity and the absolute manifestation of the essence, the Jalli Mulaq. A thought from the plane of Ahadzia and Ghayb of Ipsiti is the disclosure of all the names and attributes and all their implications, which are the fixed archetypes of all the existence with a single manifestation and disclosure that is absolutely simple. Kashf al-Basil al-Mutlaq Hence, with the epistemic disclosure, Kashf ilmi at the plane of the manifestation of the most sacred emanation, 
Veid Akdas takes place the disclosure of the essence, the names, the attributes, and the archetypes without there being any multiplicity or compositeness. These two approaches possess utmost firmness and sublimity, but as they are extremely subtle and based on multiple principles, until these preliminaries are not learned, and as long as there is complete and consummate intimacy and thorough immersion, as well as perfect goodwill towards those who possess divine gnosis, ulama billah, one cannot derive anything from philosophy and the terminology of the men of God and the people of the heart and from these discourses, which pile div bewilderment on bewilderment. Accordingly, it is preferable to give a simpler explanation that is closer to the understanding of the common people. And so we say that the causality and creativity of the necessary being, the exalted, is not like the causality of natural agents, which combine or dissociate the existing matters such as the carpenter who brings about changes in an existing material by arranging and separating, or like the mason who combines the existing materials. Rather, God the exalted is the divine agent who brings them into being without any prior existence, by his very will, and his will and knowledge by themselves constitute the cause for the appearance and existence of things. Hence, the realm of reality is within the purview of his knowledge and they appear from the hidden realms of divine ipsity, by his making them manifest. And with him are the keys of the unseen. None knows them but he. Surah 6 verse 59. It is said that the realm of concrete existence in relation to the sacred essence of God, the glorious, is like the relation of the mind to the human soul, which brings into being thoughts, ideas, and images by mere willing and manifests that which lies in the hidden realms of ipsity, ghaybe, huwiya. Hence the entire realm of reality is within his knowledge from which they appear and to which they return. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Verily, we belong to God, and to Him do we return. To offer a clearer explanation, the knowledge of the complete cause of a thing implies the knowledge of that thing. For example, the astronomer's knowledge of the timings of solar and lunar eclipses is due to his knowledge of their causes. By recording the movements of the sun, moon, and the earth, he calculates the time when the earth will be positioned between the sun and the moon, or the moon between the earth and the sun. And should his records be correct, his forecast will not fail by a single second. And since the entire chain of causes and effects terminates in the sacred essence, the source of all sources, and since God the Exalted has the knowledge of his own essence, which is the cause of all existence, being the cause, he has also the knowledge of the effects. From among the above-mentioned explanations, Everyone adopts one which corresponds to his plane, and some of them are firmer and more adequate in meeting the purpose than others. The meaning of hearing and sight in relation to God. One of the topics discussed by major philosophers in relation to the names and attributes of God, the glorious and the exalted, is the affirmation of hearing and sight in relation to him. The majority of the metaphysicians and theologians reduce hearing and sight to knowledge and the August Sheikh Ashle Ishraq has reduced knowledge to sight and hearing. Each of them has offered an explanation in this regard, whose mention will take us beyond the requirements of brevity. We will explain the predominant view and approach with an explanation that will clarify the truth in regard to the names and the attributes in general. It should be known that most of the philosophers and major thinkers in order to disregard some aspects, have reduced some of the names and attributes to some others, as it is well known and established among them. The will of God the Exalted consists of his knowledge of what is appropriate, Salah, and of the perfect order, like the controversy in relation to hearing, sight, and knowledge, and reducing each of them to the other, as mentioned. This matter is contrary to the truth and amounts to disregarding these aspects. Because if what is meant by reducing will to the knowledge of what is appropriate, or by reducing knowledge to hearing, or hearing to knowledge, is that God the Exalted does not possess a will, or that he does not possess hearing or sight, and that knowledge is considered by them to include will, hearing, and sight, it is an invalid position, and an unseemly statement. 
That is because it implies that God, the exalted, is the source of existence without possessing a will or the power of choice. Moreover, the criterion in regard, in regard to ascription of the attributes of perfection to God is that the attribute should be an attribute of perfection or existent, qua existent, and that it should be an attribute of the very reality of existence and from among the perfections of the very essence of existence. And there is no doubt that will is one of the attributes of perfection of the absolute reality of being. Accordingly, the more existence descends to the lower planes, the weaker it is in respect of will, until it reaches the point where it becomes totally devoid of it, whereat it is considered by all to lack will like the natures such as minerals and plants, and the more it rises towards perfection and the higher horizon, will becomes more manifest in it and stronger. Accordingly, we observe that in the chain of natural existence, when they cross the stages of prime matter, body, element, mineral, and plant, will, and knowledge become manifest in them. And the higher they rise, the more this noble faculty becomes perfect, so that the perfect man possesses such a perfect will that by his mere will he transforms one element into another, and the world of nature is subject to his will. Thus we find that will is an attribute of perfection, of existence, qua existence, and this meaning is affirmed concerning God's sacred essence without being referred to another meaning. Similarly, hearing and sight are in accordance with confirmed truth among the perfections of the absolute existent. And the reality of hearing and sight is not one dependent on physical organs, and they do not constitute modes of cognition limited to organs and instrumental means. Rather, the need for organs is for manifestation of the soul's hearing and sight in the realm of nature and the mulk of the body, even as it also needs the pia matter for knowledge to be manifested in the realm of physical nature. And this deficiency pertains to the world of nature and mulk, not to knowledge, hearing and sight as such, which observes the realities of the world of the unseen ghayb and hear the Malakuti speech of the angels and the higher spirits, as in the case of Musa, the Kalimullah, God's interlocutor, who would hear the speech of God in his intimate supplications, Munajat, and the noble ultimate prophet, who spoke with the angels and would see Jibra'il salam in his Malakuti form when no other ear would hear what he heard, nor any eye see what he saw though they would be in the same gathering with the messenger at the time of the descent of the revelation Swahi. Moreover, hearing and sight are among modes of cognition, which are additional to the principles of knowledge and are other than the reality of knowledge, and they are among the perfections of absolute existence. Hence their affirmation in relation to God the Exalted, who is the very reality of existence and the mainspring of the perfection of being is necessary. And should the purpose of those who reduce will, hearing and sight to knowledge, or knowledge to them, be that knowledge and will are positioned of God in a single aspect, Haythiyat al wahida and that hearing, sight, and knowledge do not have different aspects in the sacred divine essence that is true and in accordance with metaphysical proof. However, there is no reason to limit the matter to these attributes, for all attributes reduce to the reality of sheer existence, and this matter is not contrary to positing different multiple attributes for the divine essence, or rather, it corroborates it. That is because, as has been clearly established, the nearer an existent is to unity and farther it is from the horizon of multiplicity and freer. It is more inclusive in relation to the names and attributes, so that that which is pure existence, the simple, necessary reality, glorious is his majesty, and his majestic is his power, is the ultimate unity and simplicity, and inclusive of all perfections, and possessing all names and attributes, and to him literally apply all concepts of perfection, glory, and beauty, and their applicability to the sacred divine is worthier and prior with all the degrees of worthiness and priority. To sum up, the stronger and more complete is the unity wahda of an existent. The applicability of the concepts of perfection to it is greater, and the greater is the number of its names and attributes. Conversely, the closer an existent is to the horizon of multiplicity, 
the lesser is the applicability of the concepts of perfection to it. And this applicability also becomes weaker and closer and similar to metaphor majaz. And this is because unity, wahda, is concomitant musawwiq with existence and is the perfection of being qua being. The meaning of concomitance here is that although unity and existence are conceptually different, but in external reality, the reality of existence is the same as the reality of unity. Wherever there is multiplicity, there is also to be found deficiency, non-being, evil, weakness, and disability. And this is for the reason that the lower that existence descends through the planes of deficiency, multiplicity is greater than at all the other planes of existence. The station of the Lord and the sacred divine being, glorious and exalted, which is sheer existence, is absolute unity and simplicity. And there is no way that multiplicity and compositeness should find way into him. We have pointed out earlier that existence is the principal reality of perfection and the mainspring of glory and beauty. Hence, sheer existence is sheer unity and sheer perfection, and therefore sheer unity is sheer perfection. Thus, all the names, attributes, and perfections are true of that which stands at the highest plane of unity, and the applicability of each of them to it is more justified and prior. Conversely, that which is closer to multiplicity has more of deficiency in it, and the applicability of the concepts of perfection and the names and attributes is deficient in its case and the quality of their applicability is also weak. Hence God the exalted and the glorious possesses all the perfections and encompasses all the names and attributes without any of them being reducible to another. Rather, each of them is true of his sacred essence in the literal sense, his hearing, sight, will, and knowledge. All are in their true literal sense without implying multiplicity in the sacred essence in any respect whatsoever. Arabic text, English translation. To him belong all the beautiful names and the highest metaphors and all majesty and bounties. Character of the relation of God's knowledge to the knowables. One should know, as pointed out earlier, that all existence, qua existence, with their aspects of ontological perfection, qua aspects of perfection, are known and disclosed to the sacred essence of God, the exalted, with a simple essential knowledge, ilm al-basil al-thati, and a single pre-eternal disclosure, kashf al-wahid al-azali. This disclosure, with its very simplicity and complete unity, is detailed so that not an iota of the heavens of spirit nor a particle of the earths of corporeality is outside the realm of his knowledge from pre-eternity to eternity. This knowledge and discourse is in pre-eternity and the same as the sacred essence and the knowables with their conditionings and limits. Which derive from non-being and deficiency, find an accidental occurrence, the haqq bil arad, posterior to creation, and relate to knowledge accidentally. And this accidental relation is posterior to creation, and to this reference is made in the noble tradition, where it is stated. Arabic text, English translation. And when he brought the things into being, and the known came into being, his knowledge pertained to the known. It is probable that the statement refers to active knowledge, ilm al-fi'li, which is obtained by manifestation, tajalli, through the sacred emanation, faith, muqaddas, and that which is meant by the knowables are the knowables by essence, ma'lumat, bithat, which are existential entities, huwiyat, wujudiyah, which are existential entities, huwiyat, wujudiyah, related to the sacred emanation and the light of manifestation. Hence, in accordance with the first probability, the meaning of the first statement will be as follows Arabic text English translation when he manifested himself through his sacred emanation and the accidental being appeared the knowledge pertained to the known that is the emanation appeared in the mirror of the receiver by accident of the emanation in accordance with the second probability it would mean Arabic text English translation when he manifested himself through his sacred emanation and the existence of the existence by essence became manifest that is without the limiting aspect, the emanation pertained to the receiver by essence of the emanation.
On the basis of both the interpretations, this manifestation through the sacred emanation is not subject to temporal events and changes, and the creation of God the Exalted is free from and above any trace of temporality and change, or rather from all conditioning and limitation. And since the essential knowledge, ilm is simple in all aspects and encompasses all aspects, active knowledge, ilm al which is the real sign of God and the manifestation of the essential knowledge and its mirror, is completely simple and absolutely one, encompassing the entire circle of existence without the there being any conditioning change or composition in it. At the most, it is sustained in its essence, mutaqawwam bil that by the sacred divine essence, and is the very sureness of dependence, and in this respect is annihilated fani in divine majesty, and is the very presence before the Lord of God glory, and therefore it is considered God's knowledge in the same way that the very creation by the rational soul of intelligible realities in the realm of the intellect and of the imaginary images in the tablet of imagination are the act of knowledge of the soul and annihilated fani in its essence that the metaphysicians have said that the relation of the tablet of reality to god is like the relation of the forms of knowables to the soul due to this encompassment simplicity and influence they have said that god the exalted knows the particulars with his universal knowledge ilm al kulli that is the particularly limitation and being contained of the known does not cause limitation in divine knowledge Hence, divine knowledge is encompassing, pre-eternal, qadim azali, and unchanging, while the known is contained, limited, temporal, and changing. Those who are unfamiliar with the manner of their speech have been led to imagine that they have negated God's knowledge of the particulars, taking kulliya and particularly juziya, in the sense current in the jargon of logicians and lexicographers. Ignorant of the fact that these terms have another meaning in the terminology of the people of Gnosis, Marifa, and at times speculative philosophers, Ahl al-Nazir, have followed them in this regard. Rather, this conception pertaining to the topic of the knowledge of the necessary being, glorious is his name and exalted is his station, has been borrowed by the metaphysicians from the Gnostics. The criterion relating to positive and negative attributes. The criterion relating to the positive and negative attributes of the sacred essence of the necessary being, glorious as his name, is that every attribute pertaining to the attributes of perfection and excellences of beauty that applies to the principle of the reality of being and the absolute essence of existence, without any dress of conditioning or change from one realm to another, and refers to the actual hasty and luminous essence of being, is among the attributes that are necessarily subsistent, and necessarily realized for the sacred essence, exalted is its station. That is because should it not subsist, it would imply either that the sacred essence is not sure existence and absolute being, or that sure existence is not sure perfection and absolute beauty. Both of these are false conclusions from the viewpoint of the path of Gnosis, as well as the way of metaphysical reasoning, as stands established in its own place. And no attribute and excellence is established for an existent, except after its descent to one of the stages of conditioning and its assumption of one of the forms of limitations, and its embracing one of the planes of deficiency, with its accompanying limits of finitude and feebleness, and in brief that which does not pertain to the essence thought of being, and derives from limits and essences, mahiyat, is from attributes whose negation is necessary, and whose realization is possible in respect of the absolutely perfect essence. That is because in the same way as the absolutely perfect essence and the absolute being is the instance of sheer perfection, it is also the instance of the negation of deficiency, limits, non-existences, and essences, mahiyat. And that which is well known among the authorities that the negative attributes reduce to a single negation, which is the negation of contingency, does not appear to be correct to this author. Rather, in the same way that the sacred essence is the essential instance, mistaq, dhati, of the, all the attributes of perfection, and none of them reduced to another as clarified above, so also it is the accidental instance of the negation of each of the deficiencies.
And one cannot say that non-existences and defects make a single aspect, and that there is no distinction between non-existences la meza fi al adam. Because if one were to consider the matter in the context of actual reality, in the same way that absolute non-existence is a single aspect while representing all non-existences. So also, absolute existence has a single aspect and is the possessor of all perfections. Hence, from this viewpoint, which is the consideration of Ahadiyya and of the unseen of the unseen, Ghayb al ghuyub one cannot possess any attribute, neither the real positive attribute nor the negative divine attribute. But from another viewpoint, which is the consideration of the station of Wahidiyya and the inclusion of the names and attributes, as there is a multiplicity of positive attributes of perfection, every attribute of perfection implies a negation of the deficiency opposed to it. In the same aspect that the sacred essence is the essential instance of knower, it is the accidental instance of not ignorant. And as it is powerful, it is not powerless. And as it is established in the sciences of the names, that among the names and the positive attributes, there is a relationship by virtue of which some of them encompass and dominate others, which are encompassed and overlooked by them. By implication, these concepts also apply to the negative names and attributes. Now that we know the criteria, of the positive and negative attributes, we can understand that motion which subsists through potentiality and prime matter and temporality and renewal are in its very essence, does not apply to the sacred divine essence, the glorious and the exalted. And speech, the column, in the ordinary sense, about which the narrator poses the question, is an attribute that is time-bound and subject to renewal and so does not apply to the essence of God, the exalted. But this does not preclude the positioning of essential speech, takallum dhati, for God, the exalted, on the plane of the essence, in a sense that is free from temporality and renewal, who doeth. To put this noble topic briefly, the reality of speech does not depend on the vocalization of speech from certain organs. This limitation pertaining to ordinary language and general usage derives from habit and familiarity, as well as thoughts and ideas. Otherwise, there is no limitation or conditioning in the meaning of speech itself. Knowledge comprises of sheer cognition and the manifesting of a thing to the knower, and it is not confined to being cognized through some material means such as the brain, or through such non-material means as the common sense, his al-mushtarak, or the tablet of imagination, for instance. If supposedly one were to acquire the knowledge of something through his hand or foot or see or hear something, it would still be knowledge, hearing and sight. Similarly, when someone sees, hears, and speaks in the world of dreams, all these concepts apply to that, that which is heard, seen, or spoken in dreams, without any trace of metaphor, although none of the specific sense organs is implied. Hence the criterion of cognition as such depends on the applicability of these meanings and concepts. The reality of speech is the expression of that which is in one's mind and consciousness with or without the mediation of any special organ, even if supposedly it should be metaphorical in accordance with language and usage. These limitations do not exist in the concepts and meanings themselves and are applicable in accordance with reason. We do not have any philological discussion on the topic of the names and attributes, and the purpose here is affirmation of the meanings themselves, though language and usage should not be helpful to their affirmation. Accordingly, we say that the reality of speech is the expression of one's intent whether or not it occurs through sensible means, and regardless of whether it belongs to the category of sound, words, or aspirations. Speech in this sense is among the attributes of perfection of existence for self-manifestation and expression belong to the reality of existence and subsist through the reality of existence. And the more existence is sent towards perfection and strength, its self-manifestation and expression become greater until it reaches the highest horizon and the exalted station of necessity, which is the light of lights and light upon light and manifestation upon manifestation expressing that which lies in the unseen ghayb of the station of wahidiyya.
unity that is at the plane of the sacred emanation through the unconditioned sacred emanation Faith al-Muqaddas al-Itlaqi and the existential word be and by expressing through the most sacred emanation and the essential Ahadi manifestation the absolute ghayb and the stationless station of Ahadiyya unity that is at the plane of the most sacred emanation and in this Ahadi manifestation, the speaker is the Ahadi sacred essence and the speech is the most sacred emanation and the manifestation of essence, the Jalli Dhati, and the listener, the names and the attributes. By that very manifestation, the conditioned expressions, ta'ayunat, of the names and the attributes comply and obtain occurrence in knowledge, taqaq al-ilmi. In the Wahidi manifestation, through the sacred emanation, Faith Muqaddas, the speaker is the Wahidi sacred essence, inclusive of all the names and the attributes, and speech is the manifestation itself, and the listener and the compliant one on the plane of realization are the cognitive archetypes, Ayan, Ilmiya, implied in the names and the attributes which obtain concrete realization by the command B. Arabic text. English translation. So when he says be to every archetypes that he wills to create, it complies with the divine command and it is as actualized. And there are many traditions which we have not mentioned that may be cited as evidence on this topic and all praise belongs to God firstly and lastly. End of 36th hadith. The attributes of God.